It's now time to set stage for the first plenary session. The first plenary talk is by Sri K. Chakravarti, IAS retired, the Chancellor of Sri Satisai Institute of Higher Learning and trustee Sri Satisai Central Trust. Sri Chakravarti Garu has had a very interesting journey in his life. A spark of pure brilliance. At the age of 24, he completed his university education in economics and law and was inducted into the prestigious Indian Administrative Service, the IAS. During his tenure at the central and state governments, he has earned himself a reputation for competency and integrity. Although a native of Tamil Nadu, Mr. Chakravarti opted to serve in the Andhra Pradesh cadre because the call of the Lord Venkateshara of the Tirupati Hills was irresistible to him. Born and brought up in a Vaishnavite tradition, he found no place better than closest to Tirupati to offer his administrative services. But hidden behind this was another blessing in disguise. When he was appointed as the collector of Anantapur district, Puttaparthi, where the SSSIHL is headquartered, fell in his jurisdiction. On the insistence of his wife and a colleague, he finally visited Puttaparthi and had his audience, the first ever, with Bhagwan Sri Satisai Baba. And since then, life has not been the same for him. At the pinnacle of a thriving career, he shifted gears from IAS to SAI Sai. He and his wife have been the residents of the ashram at Prashanti Nilayam since 1981. An avid reader, an engaging conversationalist, and an excellent speaker, Sri Chakravarti is a pleasure to listen to at any time. And for today's talk, the first in this webinar, Sir has made a conscious choice to talk of the trials of Job and Satya Harishchandra to infuse in all of us listeners the spirit of resilience. Thus, the very first session begins with the genre of wisdom literature, the book of Ezekiel and the Markandeya Purana about men who refused to curse God despite their troubles. Over to Sri Chakravarti, sir. My prayerful salutations to the lotus feet of Bhagwan. I'm glad that the English department of Sri Satisai Institute of Higher Learning, Anantapur campus, has taken the initiative to organize a conference titled The Spirit of Life in Literature, Characters of Resilience. It is noteworthy that the conference is not restricted to English literature, but to literature as a whole. This wide scope enables me to speak for the next few minutes on the impactful story of Job from the Bible and of Harish Chandra from Markandeya Purana. The book of Job is part of Hebraic literature. It grapples with a kind of deepest, in fact, intractable problem of human life, namely the problem of evil, and most specifically, the problem of the suffering of the innocent. No conclusive answer is available as you are left with or at the mystery of God and His creation. We are left 
with accepting God's will, without insisting an answer to the question, why do the innocent suffer? We are driven to the conclusion that we should submit to the will and wisdom of God. In arriving at such a conclusion, we find that men such as Job face their suffering patiently and stoically. Job is known to the world as a man of righteousness and piety. He had been blessed with a large family and extensive property, both fixed assets such as land and movables as sheep, oxen, camels, etc. It is seen from the book of Job that the problem for Job appears when Satan expressed to God that Job's devotion to God is not unshakable and in fact rather superficial. If you are to be denied the riches which has been blessed with, so far, he may even turn against God. God, however, is convinced about Job's sincerity and steadfastness that he allowed Satan to put Job to test in many ways except being deprived of life. Satan's design starts with depriving Job of his material possessions and all his loved ones which until then had conferred on Job his joy. It is to be noted at this point that steady deprivation of all possessions that invested Job's life with joy and peace till then did not leave Job with any sense of being forlorn and in fact brought out his resilience in the face of odds manifesting itself as a continued faith in and devotion to God. He expressed that his material and financial wealth was solely due to the benediction of God. And the same God has chosen to take them away from him. The continued faith of Job in God revealed his extraordinary resilience. The evil that Satan represents does not stop with deprivation of material riches of Job. He devises even more sinister deprivation, this time afflicting him with leprosy, a dreaded disease. It's a condition which a sufferer has without any hope of recovery. And as the disease progresses, makes a person an outcast without hope of recovery or of any human company. This denial and deprivation of all that constituted life of Job until then invites his friends to make observations about the beneficial impact of punishment and about the need to abide by God's dispensation. One of them remarks that no just man has ever, ever perished altogether. Job's punishment is for his own good. We find at this point Job's reproach to God for behaving as persecutor and tormentor and even goes to the extent of declaring that it is futile for man to be content with God for justice. And as such, he would like to have the peace of death. Job feels that his body and spirit have been broken by repeated attacks. We find at this stage the extraordinary resilience which Job displays when he claims that in spite of enormous suffering, his prayer to God was, has not lost its authentic quality. He is deeply aware 
that he cannot summon anyone except God himself to prove his innocence. Strange that he whom Job believes is the cause of his suffering has to vouchsafe for his sinless record. He finds his position extremely hopeless as he cannot afford to question God and secure an answer. He is therefore driven to feel that he can find release only in death. Another of his friends chastises Job from bringing charges against God and accuses Job of rebelliousness against God and advises that he should appeal to God for mercy for God hears such prayers. We see that the views expressed by his friends were more in the nature of rebuke and Job could not understand why his friends failed to see that it was God who brought about this extraordinary misfortune. He became so desperate that the only defense he can hope to have is to have his words spoken in the context of his total alienation from all his friends and relatives and to have this inscribed on a rock which are at least to stay as a permanent record of his words. There was a deep-seated feeling in him that eventually his innocence would be recognized by God and become his defender. This is where one can see the extraordinary resilience of Job. No doubt that Job had grievances and complaints against God. He retained his faith in God to the extent that he said that he would see God even if the nerves in his body were wrecked. There is no doubt Job made complaints about God for all the misfortunes that has come upon him. But he still had the conviction that the accusation of his friends would be set aside by the avenging sword of the divine justice. When Job is put through a series of misfortunes and after his friends admonish him, we, fear, we hear him in plaintive tones the following. My soul is weary of life. I leave my complaints upon myself. I'll speak in the bitterness of my soul. I'll say unto God, do not condemn me. And a little later he says, Is it good unto thee that thou shouldst oppress, that thou shouldst despise the work of thine hands and shine upon the counsel of the wicked? And still later he says, Thou knowest that I am not wicked, and there is none that can deliver out of thine hand. Thine hands have made me and fashioned me together round about, yet thou dost destroy me. Later Job says, Hast thou not poured me out as milk and curdled me like cheese? And then thou hast granted me life and favour and thy visitations hath preserved my spirit. We find Job still later the following lines. If I be wicked, woe unto me. And if I be righteous, yet will I not lift up my head. I am full of confusion. Therefore, see thou mine affliction, for it increaseth. Thou huntest me as a fierce lion. And says, Though he slay me, yet will I trust in him, but I will maintain my own ways before him. And there are some more powerful lines. My friends con me, but mine eyes poureth out tears unto you, God. Let's listen to more powerful lines. Yet strip me of my glory and taken the crown from my head, yet destroyed me on every side, and I am gone. He has put my brethren far from me, and my acquaintance are verily estranged from me. They that dwell in my house and my maids 
count me for a stranger. I'm an alien in their sight. And they whom I loved are turned against me. And though after my skin worms destroy this body, yet in my flesh I shall see God. Here do you find pathos and also stubbornness of faith revealing an extraordinary resilience. Let me conclude with the adage, all is well that ends well. When the Lord answered Job out of the whirlwind, Knowest thou the ordinances of heaven? Can thou set the dominion thereof in the earth? Who has put wisdom in the inward parts? Or who hath given understanding to the heart? For Job, all his ordeal would seem worthwhile. After a long chastisement, the Lord blessed in a manner that at the end, Job was more prosperous than at the beginning. In fact, God doubled his prosperity and he was left with plenty all round in cattle, riches, children and children's children. After all, resilient space. It is not only in Hebraic literature that we find a great person like Job. We find a great one in the literature of Bharat too. That's the story of Satya Harish Chandra, the king who despite all the troubles to which he is put, stays true to his own righteous conduct. The story forms part of Markandeya Purana and Harishchandra was a king who belonged to the illustrious Ikshvaku line. The king was asked by sage Vishwamitra to give him money to complete the yaga which had begun and for which Vishwamitra asked for Harishchandra's kingdom along with his chariots elephants, horses and his army and all his possessions. Arishchandra said that he is placing everything at the sage's feet. There is even more which Vishwamitra sought by way of Dakshina for the Rajasuya Yaga. As Arishchandra had no money, he said he would give it in a month's time. And when he was not able to give it within the agreed time, he worked as a slave by selling himself and still he was not able to find the money he agreed to give Vishwamitra. He then resorted to sell his wife and the son. He paid Vishwamitra the money he received as sale proceeds of the sale of his wife and son. Even then the amount was not sufficient that he owed to Vishwamitra. He then became a servant of an outcast, much against his own will. He, however, carried his, his duties diligently. As a person who was in charge of the crematorium, he found that his wife had brought their dead son. He then made a pyre and placed his son's body. He then went into deep meditation, thinking of Lord Krishna. As Arishchandra was in deep meditation, the lords, including Yama, presented themselves before him and told him that sage Vishwamitra enacted this whole drama to tell the world about Harishchandra's greatness. The chief of gods approached the pyre and then caused a rain of nectar on it. Harishchandra's son came out of pyre as if he woke up after long sleep. The Lord of Death revealed that the outcast for whom he had been working was verily the Lord of Death himself. There is more evidence of Arishchandra's greatness just brought out when he refused to enter heaven unless his subjects were allowed to enter. The Devendra thereupon extended an invitation to all the subjects of Arishchandra to come to heaven. Markandeya Purana says, that those who read the story of Arishchandra will themselves become ideal human beings. This story sets out the enormous strain that was put on Arishchandra and how through it all he steadfastly adhered to truth and right conduct. He revealed nobility through all the trials and difficulties. 
when he insisted on his subjects gaining entry into heaven along with him truly a story of enormous resilience thank you that was an eloquent talk on a widely and extravagantly praised text the book of job lord alfred tennyson has called it the greatest poem of ancient and modern times what is even more brilliant was that sir brought together a book of the hebrew literature with one of eastern oriental literature the book of job with the story of satya harishchandra from markandeya purana and i thought that was absolutely brilliant and as i sat listening to sir stock what struck me were lines from job which says the lord has given and the lord has taken away and in absolute faith he says shall we receive good from god and shall we not receive evil our listeners are enthralled by your thoughts and we have a couple of questions from a lot of them we will take a few of them for your indulgence sir in the first place one of the listeners wishes to know why have you specifically chosen job and satya harishchandra for your talk now i originally thought of taking up the case of benjamin disraeli the prime minister of england who talked about getting on top of the greasy pole so there's a very figurative expression that showed the man couldn't have really come up to that height of being a prime minister unless he had really given or met with lots of problems and uh, unless he had showed resilience he couldn't have really reached that height and of course the story of abraham lincoln was also is also a very inspiring one and he lost a lot of elections except the one which became a presidential election and that really meant a change in the course of history but then when i read this the way in which you had given or put the title of the talk you said the spirit and then the bracket you read is spiritual then i thought i may as well take advantage of that and go on to something beyond the secular literature the two of the characters which immediately struck me as being characters which have really faced ordeals of a nature which i think in the normal course human beings don't meet and one or the other misfortune they might have a series of misfortunes cumulatively in you know are not normally faced by human beings but if there is his historic of course if you look at job he is still treated as a historic character in hebrew literature not a mythical character and uh, if you can concede ramayana as the itihasa of india and uh, harishchandra comes in that illustrious line of ikshvakus i thought it be good to pick up that character as a part of our itihasa rather than in a very conventional sense of being a secular literature that's why i chose these two characters that's absolutely convincing sir thank you for drawing attention to the title spirit expanding into spiritual of life uh your your answer brought my focus back on that thank you for that a second question that we can take talks about 
would you treat these characters and their stories as mere stories or legends or mythology? What is your opinion on this? When does history become legend and when does legend become mythology? It's very difficult to answer. Now, do we treat Rama or Ramayana itself as uh, history or uh, beyond that legend? Or is it even gone beyond the stage and becomes mythology? For us, Rama is a character not bound by time, but essentially in time. He is not out of time. And the eternality of the message makes it all the time relevant. So I thought in a similar way, Job's trials and tribulations are not defined by the historicity of time, but by the continuity of time. And therefore, he will remain relevant for all time to come. That's why I thought I would possibly speak about him. Fantastic. I think uh, that's an altogether new perspective that you gave us about time and history. And in connection with this, maybe we can take this question because it's very topical and relevant, I think. How is this particular talk and the characters that you talked about relevant for modern man in these times of pandemic and panic? I think... Humanity has faced worse crisis and come out of it. I mean, if you really look at it, could there have been a crisis greater than Mahabharata itself? And in those days, when so many people are reported to have been killed. So I think the historicity of time and the eternity of time, etc., are more in the nature of our considering them as bringing out lessons to us which we can draw, out of which we can draw inspiration. You are not cowed down by the problems. At least you see a character who says that in spite of wilting under pressure, he still has they never say die spirit and come out of it and says, that let me face. So they think that tomorrow can be better than today's, although the today's are worse than the yesterday's. So how do you fix yesterday's and today's and tomorrow's? The so concept of time, the relevance of what happened at a point of time, I mean, these are difficult to consider as distinct in time unless you really consider all of them as part of the flow of time. That's right. what I thought right. that these two characters bring out. It is, um, it, it is defined by time. It is defined by possibly a, a certain happening at a point of time. That part of it is there. But they seem to be always relevant. There is some relevance about it because down the centuries, human nature has not changed. We may perhaps sometime become more than human beings and become, I mean, if you have something like a superman of Sri Aurobindo. But otherwise, we will still continue to have the same problems of uh, striving for perfection, but failing, but not giving up, and then once again take, picking it up. And uh, through it all, there is uh, a hope, and that hope is what characterizes humanity. Thank you, sir, for sharing your valuable time and thoughts with all of us. 
There are many more questions. We will try and answer some of those questions on our email group.